Acts chapter 18. If you need a Bible, we've got one to give to you to put in your hands. Again, it's Acts chapter 18. Each week we have someone different read our text for us and make a few comments of application and then we go into the teaching itself. And those application points from the scripture reader and some that I'll be bringing out we uh, have listed on the back of the bulletin. These are acts, facts that we're going to be um, highlighting as we go along. So if you've turned there, we're going to ask Mr. Martin if he might come on forward here. We'll be hearing from him for a scripture reading. Once again, in Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 1. Maybe we can start out with a quick prayer. Dear God, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, just pray, Lord, that you can help me to read it clearly. Lord, to uh, speak uh, quickly and succinctly. Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because bodies had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads, for I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in the city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes of Jews, there would be reason why I should hear, bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off it, Centria, for he had taken a vow, and he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and had gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order of strengthening all the disciples. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, 
he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. I really enjoyed this chapter, um, and I, I saw a few elements that I, I think could tie together with uh, last week's chapter uh, 17. And what I wanted to highlight for the Acts fact here was how Apollos followed a similar path as Paul had used before. How he, when he ministered to those he was sharing the gospel with, he used a common point of reference, which in this case was the scriptures. When he was talking with the Jews, their basis of foundation was the scripture, the Old Testament, the Torah. And as he already knew the Old Testament, he was able to meet them where they were at, minister to them on a common point, and show them Jesus through the scriptures, and give them evidence that Jesus was the Christ through the scriptures that they already knew. In chapter 17, Paul was talking to the Greeks, and when he was in the Areopagus, they didn't have a knowledge of the Old Testament, so he didn't. Paul didn't use that tactic, that method, but he still had the same approach. He had noticed the uh, the temple to the unknown God. He knew he knew this, noticed that they were uh, people who liked to worship. They they had a call from God in their hearts, but they also liked to reason and discuss the ideas. So he had a platform to bring the gospel. Since they didn't acknowledge the scriptures. He brought them creation, which we see around us. And it's still a similar platform that we have today. We may not have a common platform of uh, people recognizing the authority of Scripture. They may not recognize the foundation of the Bible. Our society is starting to, to deny that. Um, it doesn't mean that they can't recognize everything around them. The sun rises. And as we try to start to give our testimony, as we share Christ, as we share what we believe, People may come from a standpoint and say, I don't believe that. Relativism. And then they'll try to talk about their belief foundation. And that gives a perfect opportunity to show how our Genesis account actually addresses what we see in science and nature around us more accurately than the very many changing theories that comprise evolution today. We're in an area with a lot of colleges and students, a lot of people who've been trained out through our, our uh, secular school system, on a religious belief of faith in evolution. It is a religious belief of faith in evolution because science doesn't back it up. When I grew up, there used to be a big bang, there used to be one on one theory of evolution. It's now comprises 30 different theories. So, <clears throat> as we're called on to give an account for the hope that we believe, uh, for, for, the, for the reason for the hope that's within us, what task we have to do is to learn and understand the scientific foundation for creation that's in the Bible. There's great resources from Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham, Creation Science. There, there's a lot of information out there, but it's not an excuse not to witness and share, right? Because everybody knows and sees creation around us. So for me, the Acts fact is the last chapter of Acts 18, where Apollos is vigorously refuting with the Jews publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He uses a common point of reference what they understand. It's the same as what Paul did in Greek, uh, with the Greeks. Um, there's an opportunity to reach people based on a common point of reference. And if you can understand um, the first few chapters of Genesis, that is really a, a great foundation for explaining the creation we see around us. So thank you for the opportunity. We are following Paul, the Apostle Paul, on his second missionary journey. You remember he started at the town of Corinth. That was his hometown, his home church. He went through present-day Turkey. He went across a little body of water and got to what is Macedonia and present-day Greece and started planting churches in Europe, the first time that anyone had done that. He was debating with some idol worshippers in Athens when we last saw him. There he was amongst these idol worshippers and he was sharing with them about Jesus. Now we come to today's chapter and Paul presses on to the city of Corinth 
and at last he'll finish this second missionary journey and get all the way back to his home church. Along the way, we're going to meet some new friends. We're going to meet some people who, like Paul, are Christians who are impacting the world for Jesus Christ. I'm thinking about a man named Aquila and his wife named Priscilla, and also a very learned man named Apollos. We're going to meet these people as we go through this chapter. I want to share this with you, even as we're in the introduction of our message. The spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ depends on the multiplication of gospel workers. Did everyone catch this? Jesus one time said, it's not that the harvest is so limited, but that the, the workers are few. That's the problem, he said. There is a need for more gospel workers. And we're talking about workers of all kinds. Here are three of them we're going to meet in this chapter who say, I will give my life in my own way that I can to reaching other people for Jesus Christ. And in fact, as we go through the book of Acts as a whole, we run into lots of different gospel workers. Young people like Timothy, professional people like Luke, married people like Priscilla and Aquila, single people like the Apostle Paul, very new Christians like Lydia, some fairly ordinary Christians all through this book and up to today, people like you and like me, ordinary people who God says, will you be the kind of worker for the gospel that will allow this to continue to spread? Let's see what happens in chapter 18. In the first verses it says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Now, Corinth is a fairly big city. It was known for shipping. There were a lot of sailors there. There was a lot of immorality there. Let's see if we can spot Corinth on our map here. He had been in Athens, and then he comes along here to Corinth, leaving from Athens, going to Corinth. He gets there, and he finds it's a very different kind of city than Athens. Athens was really sophisticated, and people debated things. And it was, I don't know, it was a university sort of a place. It was Ann Arbor, only bigger. It was like that. That was Athens. He gets to Corinth. And it's a shipping town and a sailor's town and a town of all kinds of vices of every sort. And it was just a kind of a raw place. But there's one thing that both the cities had in common, and that was they both needed Jesus Christ. People of every single kind need the message of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, I'm here. I'm going to start talking to people about the Lord. The very first thing he would always do is he would find people who were Jewish people who at least shared a common background in the same scriptures. And he would say, I'm going to share with you something about the Lord based on the scriptures. And so that's what he went out, set out to do is to meet a Jewish believer or a Jewish person at all. And as it turns out, the person he met was a Jewish Christian, a man named Aquila. And Aquila had arrived from Rome and is now living in Corinth. We're going to see Paul meeting Aquila. And there's Aquila and his wife Priscilla. And we need to say a few things about these people. There's a little checklist of things we know about Aquila and his wife Priscilla. The first thing that we know about them is that they had previously lived in Rome. And they evidently were already believers. They had already heard something about Jesus Christ. You say, well, they're living far off in Rome. How did they get this knowledge? Probably it was this way. All the way back at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, there were people who had come from everywhere. And it lists where they all come from. And some of them had come from Rome. They had come from Rome and they had listened to the things about Jesus. Peter taught them. The Holy Spirit came on them. And then they later dispersed and went everywhere. And some of them probably went back to Rome. In fact, we know that they went back to Rome because, in just a moment, I'm going to tell you something we have from the historical writings of that day that tells us that Christians went back to Rome and shared this, all right? So people went back to Rome and they shared this message rather widely, and other Jews got saved. People like Priscilla and Aquila got saved. And you remember what happened when Paul went to Thessalonica, and he got there, and he shared about Christ, and there were some Jews that got saved, and some Gentiles that got saved, and the Jews got upset about this. Do you remember what happened? They rioted. Do you remember this? There was a riot that swept through the city. And, as we're going to find out in future chapters, like when Paul gets to Ephesus next week, there's going to be riots there. Somehow, Jesus coming and turning people's lives upside down makes some people angry. And this isn't so much even, I think, a rational thing. It's a spiritual thing. Something really, really triggers things. I think Satan desires for people not to respond well to Christ. And so things can get really out of hand in a hurry with this kind of rioting. Not the Christians rioting, but people who are angry about Jesus rioting and trying to do bad things to these Christians. Now, in Rome, people got saved. 
Paul wasn't even there yet. He's not going to Rome, but others have brought this message. People got saved. And you know what happened? There was... There was rioting. Yes, if you were following this. There was rioting. People were all, you know, burning houses and bashing each other over the head and so forth. And a lot of this was the Jews who were angry about other Jews becoming Christians were rioting. Claudius was the emperor in Rome. And he was not somebody who was favorable to the Jewish people anyway. There has been a streak of anti-Jewish feeling that has gone through every society. It's something Satan does to stir people up against Jewish folks, and Claudius felt that way. And here was his opportunity to do something bad to the Jews because they were having riots there. And so he expelled them. He got rid of them all. This is recorded in a Roman document that goes all the way back to that day. The name of this document is it's called Claudius 25. And this tells all about what happened in Claudius's reign. And a writer tells about why the Jews were thrown out of Rome at that time. And he says it happened because the Jews had continual tumults instigated by Crestus. He was not somebody who was very well versed on all of what the riots were about, but he knew there was this Christ guy, this Crestus guy, he ends up misspelling it. And he says, this Christ guy apparently was stirring up all kinds of riots. There was troubles, or maybe people were writing, writing about Christ. Whatever this thing about Christ was, there were riots, says this Roman guy. And the Roman guy writes this down. It says, for that reason, the emperor finally threw all the Jews out of Rome. I think this is very interesting. First of all, I'll tell you again, where the message of Jesus Christ arrives, it does provide a kind of a spiritual battleground. And it... It's not something where people you know, are saying, well, we just only have the Bible to account for this, and we don't know if this all really happened. Here I'm citing to you something way outside the Bible from somebody who doesn't even completely understand all of what he's talking about, except that he says, wow, I read in the edict that there's something about the Jews rioting, and it has to do with this Christ guy or something, and they all got thrown out of town. And I doubt if they had a whole lot of time to pack their things. They were just told, you're out of here now. And so Priscilla and Aquila, this husband and wife, end up having to pack what little they can escape with, and off they go and they move to Corinth. Is everybody with me on this so far? They move to Corinth, and they've got one business that they know how to take up when they get there, and that's leather working, where you take leather and you would cut it into pieces, and you stitch it together in a really, really careful way so it's watertight, so you could use this to make a tent or something that wouldn't leak. Also, people would come and they'd say, well, I have you know, a leather water bottle, or I have a leather apron, or I have a leather whatever that needs to be repaired or made or whatever. And so they would do this kind of leather work. That's the work that they would do. And it tells us that Paul met Aquila and his wife Priscilla there. They had recently come to Italy because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome here in verse 1. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Here we have a picture of Paul working alongside, it was like very big stitches in my opinion. Thinking. But in any case, they, they're working along and they're making the tents and doing this. Paul stays and works with them. Every time we meet Priscilla and Aquila, they're hosting people in their home. They said, Paul, you come and stay with us. How long does Paul stay in Corinth? A year and a half. That's a long time to have somebody at your house. They are amazingly hospitable. They say, you come make this your home base, stay with us right here. I don't even know what kind of home they had. They just had thrown out of the previous home, and for all I know, they had something very temporary and not very spacious themselves, but said, you come, you stay. Later in this chapter, they bump into a guy named Apollos, and they say, you come over to our house, we're going to share with you about the Lord. And they're using hospitality as a springboard to be able to further God's thing. Still later, you read about them in another place where Paul writes to a certain city and he says, be sure to greet the church that meets at Priscilla and Aquila's house. They've gotten to the point a little later where they say, what we have, we want to bring in people and we'll have the church meetings right here. Do you get where I'm going with this thing? They have a gift, they have a method that they use for reaching other people and a lot of this is hospitality. So Paul stayed with them. Every Sabbath he went to the synagogue, it says here in verse 4, he reasoned with the Jews who were there, along with some Gentiles who were interested in God. He tried to persuade them that the scriptures point to Jesus. And he did this with some success. And that brings us to the second part of our message about evangelism in Corinth. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, you recall that he had left some of his mission team back in Macedonia. He went on to Athens and said, you catch up with me later. And then he not only went there to... Um, 
Athens, but now he's in Corinth, and finally, his mission team catches up with him. When they came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Let me see if I can unpack this for a moment. What Paul was doing much of the time during the day was he was sewing tents. He had the skill and he was able to do this, so he continued to support himself. There he was beyond his supply train. He didn't have monies or food or anything coming to him, so he said, fine, I'll make tents, I'll do this, I'll just supply my needs. And then in his spare time, on the Sabbath day, he would go and he would reason with people who needed to know about the Lord. Once his mission team caught up with him, it appears that they brought some funds with them and he was able to set aside what he was doing with the second job and give full-time attention just to preaching and teaching and evangelizing. All right, then? This brings up something that's of interest to us. There's a phrase that Christians use down to this day that has to do with going someplace and taking a secular job and working at that job to support yourself while you're doing ministry at the same time. And the phrase we use is tent making. You say, why do you use the term tent making? Well, now you know. It's because Paul was making tents, and that's how he was supporting himself. Occasionally, and I'm going to show you something about tent Tent making, three things. Firstly, it's always useful to know a skill that can financially support you and your family. Sometimes I talk to young men, and they're interested in missions or pastoral work or um, some other kinds of, you know, ministry. And I say, well, that's good. I advise that you would get some kind of a skill that is something that you can do that can support yourself in addition to that, because there are going to be occasions when you are going to need that, when you're going to need to be taken in some new area where there is a need for you to be supporting your family, have some skill along these lines. It's good. It's often necessary to work with that skill while doing ministry. And that's biblical. Paul does that. At the same time, the third one, it's usually desirable when possible to give exclusive attention to ministry. And to not have to do that, if it's possible. And that's also biblical. Every once in a while I run into people and they have a kind of a, oh, it's sort of a debate that's going on almost. It's the, you know, the pastor or missionary being supported financially as opposed to the one who is doing some other work and being self-supporting and, you know, the tent making versus the, uh, all the, the drawing some, some support from others kind of a debate. And honestly, according to scripture, there isn't a debate in this world. Both are biblical and Paul gladly uses both. Do you understand what I'm talking about? He goes to some place where there's the need for him to be doing it. He says, fine, I'll gladly do it. I'm not going to be shirking on this. I'll do anything I can to support myself. God called me here. And then at the same time, Paul will say, when I get the opportunity, I will be really glad to say, here's some support that's arrived. I'm going to set that aside and I'm going to be able to give my full attention to this. So from time to time, occasion to occasion, whatever is going on, Paul is adaptable and is able to do both. As Paul's ministry expands, we get to verse 6 and find that the Jewish opposition expands too. But when the Jews, verse 6, opposed Paul and became abusive, he kept going to the synagogue, sharing with them, and they got more and more abusive. And by abusive, I don't think they were just saying some unkind things. They were prone to doing what? Ryan, yeah, yeah. So we know that you know this abuse is, is, is building. They were getting more and more abusive. And so finally Paul says, I am done here. The way he does this is there in front of them, he says, shakes out his clothes, which is a symbol that I'm kind of done with you. And he says, now you are responsible for your own souls. I have had the responsibility to tell you because you didn't know. You didn't know about Jesus. And so it would be my responsibility to do it. Now I've told you, and you're rejecting this, and so now your blood is on your own heads. You are responsible for what you will face in judgment. He says that to them. And then he goes next door. He's leaving behind the people you see on the left-hand side of the screen, and they were over at the synagogue. And it says that next door to the synagogue there, there was a man who's become a new Christian, and he's got a home, and he says, won't you come to my house? We will continue our Christian meetings here. Let's see what it says. Verse 7. Paul left the synagogue, went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. And some people, even some rather prominent people, keep getting saved. I'll tell you one of the people. This is interesting. One of the people who got saved was the synagogue ruler, a man named Christmas. You say, what's a synagogue ruler? He was, oh, 
I don't know. He was the pastor of the synagogue. He was the chief uh, you know, leader of the synagogue. And he was among those who God saved. Here it says in verse 8, Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. And so, Paul shares this with people like Fitchius Justice and Crispus. And Crispus gets saved. And then Crispus gets baptized. And others get saved and they get baptized. Throughout all of the book of Acts, we see a progression, a normal pattern for the book of Acts. People will hear the word of God, they will hear the gospel, and then they will believe in the gospel, and then they will be baptized. This progression happens again and again. It's something that continues down to this day. In fact, this is sort of an aside, but some three weeks from now, we have our church camping trip, and every year when we do that, since we're there at the lakeside, that's one of the places that we have a baptism service. And there may be people here who say, I've heard and I've believed. And now the Lord is moving for me to be baptized. And that's coming up in about three weeks. In fact, the Sunday prior to that, I'll be meeting with people who have an interest in baptism and going over the scriptures. And hearing from you about what God is doing in your life and saying, this is what it is to biblically, is the grounds for what we do and then we'll be preparing for that baptism service. This is what is typical in the scriptures. Now, there's still a lot of opposition, a lot of threats, a lot of abuse. One night, I'm up to verse 9, one night, the Lord, this is Jesus Christ. Jesus comes and appears and talks to the Apostle Paul. Some of you have Bibles that are red letter editions where it has all the words of Jesus in red, and these next words are in red. This is Jesus coming to speak to him, and Jesus has something to say to him. He says, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. Let's unpack this for a moment. Jesus says, you are tempted to be afraid because of all of the violence that come against you. Don't be afraid. I'm right here with you, and there's no real danger you're under because I'm here with you. When Jesus says, go and do this thing, you are in no danger at all, at least no more danger than crossing the street because Jesus can protect you when he puts you there. Do you understand that? He says, I, I have you here. Don't be afraid of this. Yes, there's going to be many people who are going to be upset, but... I have selected many people who are going to believe you. It's your job to present this message and to find them. Do you understand that? I think when Jesus is saying, I have many people here, he's not saying, don't be afraid, there's going to be an army of people who are going to rise up and protect you. He's not saying that. He's saying instead, there's many people who are mine, they belong to me. And I've sent you there to bring the word so that they respond and it will be brought out that they belong to me. So keep doing it. There's a great harvest to you. Don't give up, says Jesus. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the Word of God. Here we have one of our Acts facts. Everyone has difficulty with evangelism. I don't know anyone who says it's just always easy all the time to share with others. There are times when others are not excited about hearing it. There are even times when Satan will say to you, who are you to be telling others? You don't have that much credibility. You never studied these certain things. Your life has had these things in the past. You wouldn't want to do that. You, you wouldn't even know what to say or how to answer it. So don't put yourself out there and share with others. Satan will try to stir up these feelings in people. It says everyone has difficulty with the evangelism. Even the Apostle Paul was tempted to be afraid. There's no reason for Jesus to talk to him about don't be afraid unless he was tempted to be afraid. Jesus urges him to keep on speaking. For our generation, the question is, will our generation speak? We are actually using a book for the young people in our church, which has been a wonderful book. It's called Will Our Generation Speak? And it's written from a very young lady who is sharing her evangelism experiences with others, and he is challenging young people, will our generation speak and share about Jesus Christ? You could be set back because of fears, and yet Jesus appeared to Paul and said, I care about reaching people and I'm using you as my mouthpiece, will you speak? Don't, give, don't be afraid, don't give up. And so that's something that we note here in this text. We see a growing church because of the evangelism. We see growing opposition, and that brings us to the third part of our message, starting in verse 12. 
While Gallio was pro-council of Achaia, you say, what did that all mean? Achaia is the geographic region where Corinth is. It's, it's, it's Greece. And he is the pro-council, which is another way of saying he was the governor, the Roman governor of that area. And he acted as something of a judge as well. And this man's name is Gallio. Gallio is this governor there. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. Aha! Now the Jews say, how can we silence this guy? I know how we're going to silence him. We're going to charge that he is teaching an illegal religion in an unlawful way and that he ought to receive some punishment and be declared that he may not speak in this way anymore. Jesus had just said, don't stop speaking, right? Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. These people are saying his speech is illegal and we ought to bring this to an end right now. And they brought this to the government authorities to use government force to stop him. All right? And they brought him before this judge, this governor named Galilee. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, and I'll quote what he says in a moment, they were charging him with something that was really a crime, if, as they understood. He is bringing an illegal religion here, illegal teaching, illegal words. We're not allowed to have any of this here. That's what they charged him. He listened intently. Gallio listened to all of this. And Paul was about to say, you know, Your Honor, actually this is in keeping with what the scriptures of our people are. This is a good thing to believe and so on. He was about to speak, but Gallio had already made up his mind. Gallio said, if you Jews were bringing to me a complaint about a misdemeanor or a serious crime, meaning either it was something that was illegal and it was a relatively small crime, or it was something that was a felony and it was a big crime, I would listen to this and take it seriously. But... Since it involves questions, verse 15, about words and names in your own law, settle the matter of your, among yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. He says, I'm listening to you all about this, and it's about the name of this guy, and the name of that guy, and this Bible verse, and that Bible verse, and I don't know, it doesn't, I don't detect that there's anything that is illegal here. You all settle it among yourselves. I'm not, I'm not going to be involved in this. So he had them thrown up in the court, verse 16. Now, I'll tell you what happens next. And this is interesting. I told you that in almost every time and place, there have been people who have had an ungodly, really a satanic hatred of Jewish people. And the Greek people who lived there in Corinth, no doubt, have been looking for ways to do bad stuff to the Jews. And they see that Gallio has just been dismissive toward a Jewish complaint. And the Greek people take that as an opportunity to, outside the courtroom, jump on some of these Jewish folks who are trying to do bad stuff to Paul. So, you know, it, it's a chain reaction. They want to do bad stuff to Paul, and the judge says, you can't do that. And so the Greeks decide, oh, we'll do bad stuff to them, and begin to pummel this poor guy, uh, Sosthenes, right outside the courtroom. And there they are, mocking him. And as it shows in the background, there is this judge, and he is sitting there looking completely unimpressed by the whole thing and not lifting a finger. You say, well, why is he doing that? I don't know for sure, except for one thing. I think he thought it was somehow poetic justice. They want to do bad stuff to others, and they've been rioting and doing bad stuff to others, and I think they will just want to calm them down if they get a taste of their own medicine. So he doesn't do anything about it, is what it tells us. Now, there's something we can learn from all of this. This whole bigger episode, let's listen now, this whole bigger episode where they take an accusation against a Christian and bring this to court. Unbelievers often attempt to use government force to silence the message of Christ. This has gone on for all of human history, using government force to silence the message of Jesus Christ. And yet, what we want to notice is you are not to be surprised and not to be silent. You say, well, it's happening here, but does this happen other places? I began to think of the constant numbers of examples. I'm, just, I'm going to trot out two of them. One of them before Paul's time. You remember Daniel. Long before Paul's time, Daniel was one who was worshiping and following God, and others decided to use the legal system, the force of the government, to come against him and say, we don't want to do that anymore. We can't allow somebody to have this kind of a a life of prayer and speaking for God, and they threw him to the lions as a result. Now, one that comes well after Paul's time. I'm thinking of somebody like John Bunyan, a man who lived in England 
at a time when preaching from the Bible was against the law. And so he was captured and brought in and told, you got to stop this preaching from the Bible and you have to do just what the government says about this. He said, no, I'm sorry, I, if I were released, I would keep preaching from the Bible until they took him off to the Bedford jail. And every once in a while they'd say, you have an opportunity to say you'll be silent on this, stop preaching, stop teaching from the Bible, and we'll let you go if you'll do that. He said, no, I'm commanded to do this. I'd keep, I'd keep preaching if I had a chance. So they kept him in jail for years and years and years and years and years and years. He was not the only one who had this experience. Many did in that generation. The main, main thing that made him different is that he um, had such a reliance on the Lord during all of that that he said, Lord, use me in some way. And he got a hold of some, um, all of some, some paper and some other things and began slowly writing something which we know as, say nice and loud, Progress. Progress, the book that, next to the Bible, has had probably the most impact in the English-speaking world, something which tells in a very long literary format about the journey of somebody from unbelief to belief and all the things he learns along the way and still a deep insight. And he wrote this. He thought, they can try to silence me so that I'm in jail and I can't preach to my congregation, but I can write something here, which he did. What I'm trying to point out to you is this. I understand that in Paul's case, he was brought before a relatively wise judge. I'll tell you something more about this Galilee fellow. He was the brother of another famous man named Seneca, who was a great philosopher. And Gallio was noted throughout the world, and it's written down in a number of other places outside the Bible, that he was a man of unusual wisdom. And when he saw all this, he said, I'm not going to use the government's power to try to silence these people. That's not right. And he didn't. But we have many men of lesser character, even down to this day, who serve as judges, government officials of all kinds who say, well, I'd be really pleased to use this power to try to silence oppositional views, try to silence, silence Christian views, and that has happened for all these years, and it will continue to happen. It is something that happens often. Don't be surprised by that, and even at that, don't allow that to be something that silences you. Bunyan found a way for it to not silence him. Am I right about this? Don't be surprised. This has happened for all of human history, but watch and see what Christ can do. And there's a little footnote to the whole story, and this is interesting. I want us to go back and take a look at what we had here, oh, all the way back in, uh, let's see. Um, it tells us, oh, here we go. Verse 17. All these people turn on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler. Now, he's the one. Let's see if we understand about Sosthenes. Some months earlier, there had been somebody named Crispus who was the synagogue ruler, and he got saved, and so he wasn't the synagogue ruler anymore. And then the Sosthenes guy became the synagogue ruler, and he launched this attack on Paul. That doesn't seem so good. So he launches the attack on Paul, and he ends up, for all of his trouble, he gets beat up in front of the, uh, the courthouse. That's not Christians doing it, it's, uh, it's for people, Greeks doing this. But this isn't the last time we bump into Sosthenes. I want you to know about what comes a little later. 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Some while later, Paul is writing a letter back to the people in Corinth. And he's writing this letter back, and he's got with him a partner in the gospel who's physically writing down the words, and who's authenticating what Paul is writing by saying that he's a part of this, and he's writing it all down, and so forth. And this man is a believer who's doing this. And it says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. And with me writing this down is our brother, Sosthenes. That's cool. At one time, Sosthenes was a self-proclaimed enemy of Christ and an enemy of Paul and was trying to bring all kinds of harm to Paul. And now, some while later, Paul writes and says, the Lord has transformed this time. He's become our brother. And not only our brother, but my co-worker and the one who's helping me to write this letter back to you. That's very, very interesting to me. Christ has an amazing ability to transform people. Well, we go on to the fourth part of our message, and we're going to finish the missionary journey, starting at verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. So even after that episode with um, <clears throat> the courtroom, he stays on a little longer, finishes the year and a half. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. 
So that married couple we met earlier, the two hospitable everywhere, they get in the boat with him and they sail off together. He and Priscilla and Aquila and his missionary team, they all head off together. And it says in verse um, 19 that when they arrived at Ephesus, Paul left Priscilla and Aquila there. So they get part way back, here's our map, they leave from Corinth and they get to Ephesus, and he's heading eventually back to Antioch where he started. But they get as far as Ephesus, which is right here, and Paul leaves them in Ephesus. To be putting it very succinctly, he leaves them there so that they can be continuing the ministry that they know how to do best. Settle in, get a home, get people to come into the home, share about Christ. They're going to be doing that, and in fact, they're going to be doing more of that in the chapter in Ephesus, the new place that they move to. Meanwhile, the Apostle Paul, in verse 18, he tells us about some Jewish things that he does. He's a Jewish man. He takes something which is a Jewish practice and has his head shaved to fulfill something that Jews would understand about a promise or a pledge to God. And then when he arrives in Ephesus, he goes and he meets with some of the Jews. He himself, verse 19, went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. The Jewish people there asked him to spend more time. They said, well, we've understood some of what you're saying for a week or two, but we need a lot more time to digest this. Will you stay with us for a while? He declined, promised that if it was God's will, he would come back again. And then he went on from there. He sailed from Ephesus, leaving for some of the Kula there. And he gets to Caesarea and goes to Jerusalem and greets all the Christians at the mother church there. And then finally ends up going from Jerusalem back up to Antioch, his home church, where he spends a good bit of time there. Let's see what the text says. Uh, let's see, he, verse 22, landed in Caesarea, went up and greeted the church in Jerusalem, and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, let's focus on those words for a minute, verse 23, after spending some time in Antioch, let's understand what this is. He was a missionary, his team were missionaries sent from Antioch, he got back there, and he spent some time with the people there, doing what missionaries rightfully do. He encouraged the people there in their walk with the Lord, and they in turn encouraged him in what he was doing. And they supported and blessed one another and spent time together and strengthened what they had this bond between. This is what missionaries do. Missionaries are sent, and then they return, and they do this kind of thing where they're really closely linked with their church that they're coming from, whatever, and then there's new plans that are made about where God is calling them next. And the church forms around them and says, by prayer and other means of support, we're going to bless you and send, and it's off you go again. Usually, when people have finished one such missionary stand, they're ready to go for the next one, and Paul does that. It says, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. What are we saying? He's starting a third missionary trip. All of this happened rather quickly. You read right past it, they specified there, and he said, well, this is the end of the one trip, spend some while with them, heads out on a new trip. And this is going to go to new places, leaving from Antioch, and at least at first, he will be heading back through this region, back through modern-day Turkey, to places where he had already been before, strengthening all the people in those places. The churches that he already helped establish, let's build them up stronger. And then, he's going to continue on heading toward Ephesus, and we're going to hear more about what he does on this missionary trip next week, chapter 19. But meanwhile, our last part of the message something about a guy named Apollos, and starting at verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Who's in Ephesus right now? Priscilla and Aquila. Let's try that again. Who's in Ephesus right now? We left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. Paul is in Antioch. We've left Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. We've left them there, and they are having this ministry of hospitality and evangelism there. And we're going to get a little scene and shifting over to Ephesus and see what they're doing before the chapter is done. Meanwhile, this man named Apollos, who originally came from Alexandria. Alexandria was the second biggest city in the world in empire. It was famous for its library and for scholarly people who sat around reading books and knowing a lot of stuff. And this was kind of what Alexandria with this um, Apollos guy was good for, and I, I don't know for sure. I get this picture that maybe he, uh, you know, got a, a, a you know, transfer where he went from the University of Alexandria to the University of Ephesus. Some reason he's going and doing learned things in a new town, and he has now gone to Ephesus, to Ephesus, and he got there. It says he was a learned man. And now look, at him. thorough knowledge of the scriptures, in addition to other things he had been studying. And he'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke with great fervor, verse 25, taught about Jesus accurately, 
though he knew only about the baptism of John, what are we saying here? News about John the Baptist, and how John the Baptist said, we are sinners who need to repent. And we need a Messiah, a Savior. And by the way, that Messiah, I've seen him. His name is Jesus. And we should follow after him. News about all of that that John the Baptist had done in his ministry had gotten to Alexandria and had come to Apollos. And Apollos had believed those things. And Apollos, when he was in Alexandria, said, we've heard who the Messiah is. His name is Jesus. And we know something about it because John the Baptist has told us about this. And John says that what we need to do in repentance of our sin is to be baptized. And that's the right thing to do. And he had taught that in Alexandria back in Northern Africa. And now he's gone to Ephesus and he gets to where the Jewish people are there. And he says, I've learned things. We need to follow this. Now all of this was true. Every bit of it was true. But by now it was 20 years out of date. Do you all understand this? Some years have gone by. And a lot has happened in the meantime. One thing that happened is Jesus died and rose again. And this message didn't quite get through to Apollos. Jesus has died and risen again. And the people who believe in Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection have now come to the place where they say, wow, that, that's something that I can not only believe in, but I can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God after I believe in him, God can be right in and with me, and I can live this life for Jesus Christ. This is the message that he didn't yet know. He didn't yet know all of this. So, Priscilla and Aquila do something. They met him there after the synagogue service was done one day, and they did something. Let's see what it says. He began to speak boldly, verse 26, in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explain to him the way of God more adequately. They said, you know, we've made some uh, blueberry pie, and we have some loose tracks ice cream. We'd like you to come over to our house. We'd like to sit and talk to you about things. We'd like to spend a little while telling you from the scriptures what the truth about Jesus is further than you knew before. You had some of the picture, but it is through faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done by his death and his resurrection in his ascension, in his sending of the Holy Spirit. And this is the more complete story, so that you can tell it all accurately. Do you believe this? And he received and accepted this. It's a wonderful thing the way Priscilla and Aquila have this home-based ministry. I know people say to me, you know, Pastor Paul, I don't just have these um, you know, great qualities of uh, having studied long and that, uh, you know, be able to say things in a really eloquent way and so on. And I don't know. I mean, maybe Priscilla and Aquila were you know, learned and eloquent, but it doesn't say that. It says they knew how to invite people over and give them snacks and talk to them about Jesus. Did it have an effect? It had a powerful effect. There are pastors who will say that they win far more people to Christ at their dining room table than ever to a church. There's something about opening your home and opening your heart and sharing your life with others and seeing people's lives transformed. And it's biblical. So much so that when the Bible lists the qualities of people who can be serving as elders in a church, it lists a number of qualities of being able to teach and so on, and then it says that they must be hospitable. They must know how to invite people over to their home and to have them stay in their home and how to open up their lives to others and to share with them evangelism and discipleship, that is showing people how the Christian life is lived, happens best in the home. And for folks to Say, I don't, I, I, I can do this. I can try. Some of you will say, Oh, I don't know. My house is a little messy and uh, I don't cook that well and so forth. That doesn't seem to me to be the requirement. Now, if you have a clean house and you cook well, that's so much the better. But <laughs> I must say, there are people who've had useful experiences with God in my house when it's been messy and when the cooking wasn't that great. We're able to do it because God says, open up your life, open up your home, and this is what I can do. So they brought him home and explained the word of God to him more ac adequately, more accurately. I guess this represents them talking to the Paulus. Maybe he's there in the center, and they're going over the scriptures themselves. After they had talked to Apollos about it, he came to really trust and understand the Lord. Apollos thought, well, you know what? I'm going to leave this place, and I'm going to go on to Achaia namely to places like Corinth and Athens, to those even greater centers of population, and I want to share this message with them there. So the Christians encouraged him, and they wrote to the disciples there, 
to welcome him. They said, this guy is a Jewish man and he's learned the truth and he's really, really biblical. Don't hesitate to make him part of the team. And he was useful. On arriving there, he was a great help, it says, to those who by grace believe. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He was a great help. He was useful to two different groups of people. Those who were already Christians, he strengthened their faith. Those who weren't Christians, he was able to express to them the truths about who Jesus really is. Now, this whole matter with Priscilla and Aquila leads us to two more Acts facts as we come near the end of our message. Successful evangelism and discipleship is very often linked to Christian hospitality. Apollos and countless people since have come to faith in Christ at someone's dining room table. It is worth the effort. And our last act, in fact, Apollos knew some of the truth, but needed the way of God to be explained to him more adequately. This is still true today. Most unbelievers do not understand the gospel. You may think that most people have rejected the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would say to you, and I would say to you this, do this to you without any hesitation. It's not that people are rejecting the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In general, they haven't understood it. When I talk with people, sometimes I'll explain the whole matter through to them about Jesus Christ and who he is and who we are before God and our sin and how we cannot save ourselves through our own efforts it is only because Jesus died for us. It is only because of his death and faith in him that we may be saved. And when I'm all done, the person will say to me, Oh, I see. Yes, I should be a better person. I should try harder to be a better person. I didn't say that. That isn't what the gospel says. I can even express the gospel and the individual still didn't get it. The greatest number of people have rejected something or at least don't understand it and aren't following it because they never got it. So when you get together, together with others, it is necessary to explain this more adequately. Most unbelievers do not understand the gospel. And now, I will have the next sentence. This is important. Most quote, Christians do not understand the gospel. There are countless people who are in churches and call themselves Christians and have not ever understood the gospel. It has been said over the years that one of the greatest mission fields is in churches where there are countless people who get together and they're there because grandma is there, because their mom and dad are there, and because they have nice um, you know, social gatherings and because it makes them feel well to be there, but they never understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's not presented and sometimes their brains are turned off and they never heard it, but there are countless folks who are, quote, Christians, unquote, who don't understand the message of Jesus Christ. They need it explained more adequately. Never be hesitant to get together with someone and say, let's get down to the basics. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't assume they've heard it. It happens too often that you get together a group of maybe teenagers or even children in a church or in some maybe a, you know fellowship setting where there's a group of teenagers who come to your home and you think, well, what can I teach these children? What can I teach these teens that they've never heard before? And you think they're going to teach them something obscure or some other thing. How about teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Some of them haven't got it. You might say, well, I'm sure you've heard it before. How many times did you hear it and your brain was turned off and you didn't get it? And then finally, at some point, it all came on. Is this true? Yeah. Never be hesitant to tell the folks again, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it needs to be explained more adequately. Well, these are lessons we learned from chapter 18, and I've got one last picture. This is one that represents, again, Priscilla and Aquila. It looks like they've got some of their... Um, all of their leather working tools and the scriptures and the uh, things there at the table to bring guests over. It's all there in the picture. These are ones who are a great example to us of people who are able to, on the one hand, give their attention to their work that supports the family, but they've got a higher calling, and that's reaching people for Jesus Christ. And they're going to do it with the most simple and natural means being bringing people into their home and expressing what the gospel is to people, whether they're people who seem really educated already or people of any kind at all, and saying, our home is open, we want to share with you about Christ. It's a great example. Lessons we learned from Priscilla, Nicola, and Apollos. And this emphasis on evangelism continues throughout the entire book of Acts. More about that next week in chapter 19.